continue our week of broadcaster special editions as we talk with network news anchormen past and present. Our focus tonight will be on how these powerful journalists dealt with and felt about the presidents they covered. We'll have David Brinkley talking about Kennedy and Nixon, then Dan Rather on his memorable televised run-in with George Bush. First up, Walter Cronkite, who covered politics and presidents for many years as the long-running anchor of the CBS Evening News. Thirty years ago, on a Friday around lunchtime, Cronkite was casually reading news reports when a bulletin came over the wire about John Kennedy. And I ran through the newsroom saying, Kennedy may have been shot, Kennedy may have been shot, let's get on the air, get on the air. We uh, learned a lesson then that, uh, that we couldn't get on the air instantly on television, that uh, we had to move our cameras into position, we had to warm them up in those days, and then uh, they, they took a while to get 20, 30 minutes to mm -hmm. warm them up and all that sort of thing, get them into position. So we went on into, I went into a radio booth, or a uh, announce booth in the television studios, and from and was there and, and made the made our first announcements. We interrupted Love of Life, I think it was, with the program, and uh, uh, and uh, from there on we did we did the first bulletin. Then we went back to Love of Life, and then went to the second bulletin that was on the way to the hospital, and there we stayed on the air from there on. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. And I was on radio that is announcing over television, sound only, with slides up from the thing, for, uh, oh, about 10, 12 minutes, I think. I've forgotten into that numbers. When they waved to me to move on into the, to the studio, he was wounded in an automobile driving from Dallas Airport into downtown Dallas, along with Governor Connolly of Texas. They've been taken to Parkland Hospital there, where their condition is as yet unknown. So we are in a great position to broadcast this kind of a story. I moved into the slot, that position. Writers moved into the corners. And uh, we started broadcasting on television. And uh, it was, oh, uh, it was about uh, an hour later when... Uh, Eddie Barker and, and uh, Dan Rather at Parkland Hospital got the tip that uh, the president was dead. Uh, we broadcast that as a, uh, as a report in the hospital. And very shortly after that, the official word came that he was dead, at which point I had a little trouble choking back the, the tears, but, uh, uh, but recovered to go on. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. Uh, presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th president of the United States. One of the interesting things was that we had an edict at CBS that nobody was to appear on the air without their jackets on. And uh, uh, I... Uh, and I also, for broadcast purposes, I, I didn't wear my glasses. I used the glasses to read all day, the little print, but at night, was coming on the air, with, with reading the prompter with the big letters, all that, I had no problem. In fact, I could read the little print, but it was a little difficult without glasses. So I didn't appear on the air with glasses. The, the, uh, I get off the air at about 6.30, I think it was. I'd been on five hours. They uh, came along and said, Charles Collingwood is prepared to give you a little relief. I hadn't even left the chair for five hours or so. And uh, when Charles came and slipped into my chair, and I got up and walked into my little office right next door, uh, I realized that I was in my shirt sleeves, <laughs> sleeves still rolled up, tie undone, hair disheveled, wearing my glasses. I hadn't even thought about that. For five hours it hadn't occurred to me how I was dressed or, or how I looked. And I've been reporting all afternoon how telephone communications were jammed all over America. 
how people were calling each other, and uh, it just you couldn't get the telephone call through. And as we all know, on a P B X board or, or P A X board, an automatic exchange board, as we all have in our had in those days, a telephone call, if it came into a busy exchange, would go right through to the first open phone, so that everything got blocked. Everything, the, the whole company got blocked. And all phones got blocked, presumably. I'd been reporting this, but I'd forgotten that I'd been reporting it. I thought I'd walk in, I'd call my wife. And I wanted to talk to a friendly voice. I'd been hearing nothing but instructions in my ear and so forth. And uh, I, was, I was ready to talk to somebody, and my wife was my candidate. I started to pick up a phone, and I had 12 lines in my office. Everyone was lighted, two phones, six lines lighted. And just as I was staring at him and realizing the problem, one of them came blank and I grabbed it. Well, there was a person on the line and it was a very cultured, terribly cultured, Upper Park Avenue voice. Hello, Mr. He, said, he said, hello, am I, I want to be connected to CBS News. Is this CBS News? And I said, yes, madam, this is CBS News. He said, well, I want to register a complaint. I don't understand how CBS News can have on the air that Walter Cronkite right now crying his crocodile tears when everybody knows he hated John Kennedy, which was the furthest thing in the world. <laughs> well, it, that's the first voice I heard. I was so overwhelmed. I did something I shouldn't have done. I said, Madam, what is your name? And she gave me a name, and I said, Anderson wasn't. I said, Mrs. Anderson, you're speaking to Walter Cronkite, and you, madam, are a damned idiot. <laughs> the phone. And then I thought, wait a minute. In reading some of the history of uh, network television news, apparently in the early 60s, and of course we're dealing then with film rather than videotape, which is so much easier to work with videotape, but uh, the standing joke was that if Jesus walked across the Potomac and it happened after 4 p.m., it wouldn't make the Huntley Brinkley report. It would have to wait till the next day. And I take it that one tangible achievement of the Cronkite newscast, and then others followed suit, was that you worked on deadline frantically, sleeves rolled up, right until airtime. Yeah, absolutely. My concept was that the deadline for an evening, for any broadcast, is when you leave the air, not when you go on the air. Uh, we ought to be, we, we've got a easily flexible medium here. Uh, if you've got the uh, capable anchor person who uh, knows news and is willing to willing to pitch in and understand the news, uh, just follow the day of day's flow of news every day, work with it. Uh, that person ought to be able to ad lib his way past a, a bulletin on the wire into background material and so forth. If you've got fast people now with tape in the editing room, you ought to be able to pull up some tape pretty quickly. We did as early as the death of uh, President Johnson former President Johnson by that point, um, we we got a call and it, and it ruined a great broadcast. <laughs> we were so efficient we ruined the broadcast. Uh, I got a call from a uh, tipster at uh, uh, at the Johnson Ranch when he died. Uh, while we were on the air, we were on the 6.30 to 7 portion, as I guess most of your audience knows, uh, on the evening news we feed at 6.30 o'clock to most most of our mm -hmm. stations repeat at seven o'clock for another portion of the stations. So on the 6:30 feed, uh, we were uh, halfway through the broadcast when this phone call came, and I almost missed it because the secretary or assistant who answered in the newsroom, uh, this fellow said, "I got to talk to Walter Cronkite right away." He said he's on the air and hung up. <laughs> Fortunately, he called back and said, uh, "I've got some news about President Johnson dying. You better let me talk to him." So at the next film piece or whatever uh, that rang through to me and I still had him on the phone when we came out I guess we came out of a commercial thank you very much Tom I'm on the air right at the moment uh, can you hold the line just a second I'm talking to Tom Johnston the press secretary for Lyndon Johnson who has reported that uh, the 36th president of the United States died this afternoon in a uh, ambulance plane on the way to San Antonio where he was taken after being stricken at his ranch the LBJ ranch in Johnson City Texas we came back at seven o'clock they only had ten minutes back in the control room and the editing studio when we came back at seven o'clock we had we led the show of course with the death of President Johnson 
but we had a perfect package that could have been built at 10 o'clock that morning. We went into his career, his background, and all that, all that film must have been prepared, of course, in advance. We had it all, and we never went back and said, this is the way we first got the news just a half hour ago. And we lost all of that drama of that phone call, <laughs> and, and I, we all regretted it. But at the moment we got off the air at 7.30, we all looked at each other and said, what did we do?